He's already with you. Why are you, where are you running to? I'm doing the fasting to see if I can do it. I'm doing um, the, the, the prayers, even though I'm not Muslim. Even, I'm just seeing, what's this like? Because I was a Christian. When I was very young, I was reading um, Mantikultair of Ator. At the same time, I was studying Buddhism because I was, I was thirsty. I was curious. Del bayar das bakar. So it means that the heart is with God when the hands, they are working. But when that light, the, the light of Quran, the light of God comes into the heart, then um, I'm free from myself. You are, you're too ecstatic. So if you see the verse, you, you, you cannot help it. You feel the power of the verse. This is very big, big, beyond, beyond anything human being can, can comprehend. So to me, that is the whole purpose. Reading Quran, it was a path that opens us to the reality, the actuality, the experience. Uh, every day, you have to take the, the Quran and you actually have to take it in. You cannot just look, look at it. I do my ablutions. It's long before the prayer time. I start doing zikr. By the time it's fajr, I'm already in paradise. Feeling, seeing, seeing the actual light in during zikr and so forth. So I was not until 40 years old, maybe, I did, had, didn't, didn't have any profound spiritual experience in the, in the sense we're talking about sadr. Because to every one of them, God has put out his hand and said, come, he's put out his word and say, I love you. Come put out his word and say, turn to me. And for me, Mantikultar was, was a great mystery. I spent years looking at it, thinking about it, thinking about, for example, the Asmal Husna and how we each of us have different characteristics. And I lost two thirds of my friends because there's prejudice. I don't care. Fine. I'm still going to explain what I know about the beauty of Islam. I live in the forest. I believe in, in the sacredness of the being alone, worship, especially if a person is older, because most people who go and study psychology is because they have something they want to fix for themselves, you see. So I knew a lot about psychology, actually. So there's an interesting psychology, the relationship between my faults, my difficulties, and my rabbi chas. He chikasro to nagardad ufano, nisro dar bargohi kibrio. That we are intended at the deepest level to be that witness uh, of God's own presence. Shahid Allahu inahu la ilaha illahu. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نرحب بكم في سلسلة حوارات فكرية ومعرفية على قناة حيرة من عمان إلى كاليفورنيا في الولايات المتحدة نتشرف بالحوار مع الأستاذ الشيخ روبرت دار عبد الحي وهو الآن 72 عاما ولديه تجربة روحية وحياتية رائعة جدا تمخض عنها كتب متنوعة ككتاب كترجمة لكتاب جولشان راز الفارسي المعروف حديقة الحقيقة للشبستري وأيضا الأشعار العرفانية للرومي وأيضا كتاب بعنوان جاسوس القلب وكتب أخرى وكتب أخرى أيضا الأستاذ أيضا مكث عدة سنوات من حياته في أفغانستان لأعمال إنسانية وخدمات اجتماعية وهو باحث عن الحقيقة وعن الروحانية
So we are uh, interviewing uh, Professor uh, Robert Der Abdel Hay. Uh, he is 72 years old now. He's talking to us from California. He has a long, interesting journey in spirituality and in the search of uh, truth. He has several publications uh, such as The Garden of Mystery um, of Shabistri and The Mystical Poetry of Rumi uh, and The Spy of the Heart. Uh, he talks uh, Persian very fluently uh, and we, we'd like to know more about his uh, journey. So welcome um, Professor or Sheikh if I may and it's honor having you with us today. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here with you. So in the beginning, um, tell us more or give us a summary about your academic, spiritual life journey, your story, uh, the main stations of it, uh, uh, whether Afghanistan or other hidden stations also. Um, and then uh, your first encounter with Islam, mysticism, Rumi poetry, uh, Persian literature, the main people who, are, who affected you and kept a great ether on your life. Uh, until you chose the path of transforming and choosing Islam and embodying it completely. So all of this just in a, in a, in a, in a summary in the beginning, so we can delve more in, in the topics. Well, the, there are a number of um, Americans and Europeans who we were reading the uh, Sufi poetry, like from Attar, the Mantik Tair, and uh, we had access to Masnavi. Uh, when, when I was only a teenager, when I was just a teenager, so what I mean to say is 55 years ago, at least, I was already reading <coughs> the Mantik in, Tair in translated into English. And, um, <coughs> and so I, I thought to myself, this is so interesting. One of these days, I have to learn this language, this Persian language, even though it seemed impossible because I'm a carpenter. So that time, I'm mainly a carpenter. And what happened is that over the years, I continued to read this material. And then I encountered, there was a group in London that was run by Idris Ali Shah. And that group, they also translated a lot of this poetry, but it was a Sufism that really didn't have uh, Islam uh, as a main factor in it. it the, 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 the Ali Shah family, yes, they were Muslim, but the Sufism was, let's call it modern Sufism. So what happened is for, for a long time, I studied that, and then I realized that I thought I wanted to go um, deeper and find out about the connection between Islam and Sufism. And what happened was just a coincidence, which is that I ended up trying to help some friends find refugees from Afghanistan who were in Turkey. And after that, what happened is um, the United Nations saw the little project that I had started in Turkey. And they said, you're doing a wonderful job. We want you to come to Islamabad in Pakistan. And I said, no, I am a, I don't know what you mean. I'm a boat builder. I don't, I don't have any qualification except my document from the state of California as a teacher and administrator. So yes, I was a teacher and an administrator. Professor is too much. I'm not really professor. A sheikh, never, I never use the word sheikh for myself. Um, I just say I'm friend of the Muslims and the Sufis, and I try to help whoever I can. So what happened is then my school burned. The school I had burned down. So I had nothing... And the same Hashim Utkan from United Nations called me and said, please, will you please come to Islamabad? I said, okay, yes, now I will come because my school has burned down. <laughs> so I, that's when I went to Pakistan. And that's when I met Muslim Sufis, people from all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, people from, uh, you know, Shah Waliullah and, and all of these other groups. And... Um, so a long story short is I met Ustad Khalil Khalili in Islamabad. And he was a great poet. He's the poet laureate of Afghanistan. 
And when I went and first meeting, he he realized I was thinking the wrong way because I was thinking I must run and find and look and find and find. And he says, listen, my friend, we say there's in Quran, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ He's already with you. Why are you, where are you running to? You are, so, so that changed my, my thinking. Just one meeting, actually, with him. It changed my thinking. And, of course, he was not only Sufi, he was a devout Muslim. So that's how it all began. A carpenter has his shop burned down, is invited to the Middle East, starts working there, meets one of the great poets and great Sufis of that part of the world, especially Afghanistan. And I feel drawn to that. And so years follow, I am working there. And more and more, I am, I'm doing the fasting to see if I can do it. I'm doing um, the 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 prayers, even though I'm not Muslim, even I'm just seeing what's this like, because I was a Christian, and then I became what we call Unitarian Christian because I did not, I was not comfortable with the Trinity idea, and so, uh, but then from there, uh, I realized by being with the Muslims of Afghanistan, their bravery, their patience their suffering, but not becoming despondent from their suffering. I thought this is a very interesting, deep religion. And I, I was therefore coming in that direction. And finally, uh, after going to Rumi's tomb in Konya, after several visits, I had, uh, uh, I, I decided there to, uh, go to the mosque next to Rumi's tomb, and that's where, in 1991, then I became Muslim there, you see? And um, so that's in a nutshell. There were lots of other details, but in a summary, summary, that's what happened. A very interesting summary, and we'd like to delve in some of the, its details throughout the, this uh, interview, inshallah. Uh, so, um, what about the decision of uh, transformation? Because many people, they choose to stay as academics, or people who study Islam as outsiders, or even people who do comparative theology, for example. Um, so you had this um, search about truth and about reality, or some, you, if you felt lacking something, or so some people beca became or become re religious uh, Christians, for example, or for example, choosing another religion. You have um, a, a lecture about a comparison between Buddhism and uh, Islamic Sufism. So. So, so, so what's that beautiful thing that may, led you to choose or uh, take this, this decision of completely embodying uh, Islam? Well, you see, so again, even though I was a carpenter, when I was very young, I was reading um, Manticul Tair of Attar. At the same time, I was studying Buddhism because I was, I was thirsty. I was curious. And not only that, also I was studying um, the, in the Hindu religion what's called Advaita. And so, uh, and, and the, here's the thing, is that um, all of my curiosity led me to, we have what we say, an ecumenical outlook. Ecumenical outlook. So that means that we, we say, let us uh, listen to what the other people in the other religion they are doing. Let us um, accept them as friends. Let us um, collaborate. Let us uh, uh, learn from each other. So this is before I become Muslim, but even after I become Muslim, I remain very interested in that. And uh, so the, the, uh, I become, yes, I actually do become someone uh, that is working with the professors because, as I was telling you earlier, Leonard Lewis and he said, "You are you know more than my student, my advanced students. You are." He says, "He says I said I'm a carpenter." He says, "In in two years, I can you can be a professor 
at the university. I said, I don't want to be a professor at the university. I want to build boats, but I am continuing to study with uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, and all that. Even though after I become Muslim, I feel very comfortable being Muslim. I don't feel any challenge, any any um, worry. Uh, I have no worry. I'm just interested in what the other people are studying, and I feel they are my brothers and sisters, and that I have every reason to become friends with other people who are doing spiritual work, you see. And if people each say, well, we are better, we are better, I say, well, I don't care. If you wish, you can be better. If you wish, I don't, um, I'm not thinking that way. I'm thinking that that uh, God has put something into us and I want to know about that. And in Islam, I, that's what I find for myself. Even though I spent years doing Buddhist meditation when I was very young, I spent years, I, we, my friends and I, we were with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the famous um, uh, guru who was with the Beatles and all of these people. So we were very experimental. But ultimately, I found my home in Islam. And I have no, uh, uh, I, I don't practice three religions at once. I practice one religion, but I'm interested in the, the relationship and the beauty, trying to, to, to see the beauty in all of the religions and to, to uh, be friendly towards all of the people in in the religions, if I, if I, uh, if if some, if for some reason, like when it was a Trinity, it was just not agreeable to me. It's just it didn't fit for myself. The only time I had uh, a difficult conversation with my mother is uh, she was uh, Catholic and she uh, was supporting the Trinity, and I said, "That's fine, Mom. It's fine if you are. This is what you." You believe <clears throat> I don't uh, say anything against that. It's just I cannot believe that, and and so she accepted me, and I accepted her. You see, and uh, so all of these things that I've done is because I do have a scholarly mind. I study things very carefully, and then people say to me, "Give a talk," and I will give a talk, and uh, I will try to bring the best to each religion, the best um, as a Muslim to bring the best of Islam and, and accept the best of the other traditions. Very interesting. So you've mentioned now the names of uh, Attar and uh, Rumi and other people, and I'll mention also, um, uh, so you've worked also about Ibn Arabi, uh, Shabestari, <clears throat> Attar and Rumi, we mentioned Hafiz and all, all these, uh, Islam and Quran, I saw some lectures also about that. So let me ask you here, and it's, it's very interesting, and it has something to say about your, person your personality in depth, that you are a carpenter and you didn't choose the academic path while it was open for you. You were able to be there in one of the universities and just uh, uh, go through this academic path and be like the other uh, beautiful uh, professors of Sufism. But uh, this uh, says uh, something special about your special journey. Um, so if you'd like to comment here about something. Well, you see, the other thing that was a coincidence, totally a coincidence, is since I was a carpenter, since I made things all my life, and a sailor, my father was a sailing captain, so we were sailing on the ocean all the time, and then I was working, making things. And, um, and when I finally was in Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan, those Sufis up there, they have an expression, um, Dil Bayar Das Bakar. So it means that the heart is with God when the hands, they are working. It, it means it's very safe because working with the hands, there's, there's, it's hard to have, you don't have so many thoughts. You're working with your hands. And if you say, uh, 
del bayar, meaning the heart with God, then you're doing a zikr, you could say. So you're given a zikr. And it's usually la 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 or something. And, and you don't, and this way you turn off all of the crazy things in the head because you're working with your hands. So when I did that, there was a coincidence. I was already a carpenter. Now I'm with people. They believe you should be working with your hands. So the, the, if you read into the account of the, the Naqshbandi Sufis in Afghanistan, going all the way back to, to uh, uh, these, the Naqshband, and, and his teacher was Amir Kulal, is a potter. But actually, he was a great theologian. But when they go into Naqshband, they say, no, you will now be a potter. I Meaning you have to make pots and think this is your, this purifies you because your head is not always working. You, you found something and you're in the body and you also have God's name while you are working. It's very, I, I like that very much. You see, so this again, just completely coincidence that it fit, it fit very well. For me, and so, uh, so naturally, I started to recommend that even to other people, where a lot of people become very intellectual, the head, the mind, thinking, thinking all the time, even about spirituality and so forth. There's still a problem, which is that in my mind, the Quran, it's intended that we should gain. The great treasure in Quran, it allows us to feel God's presence. All the philosophy, what good is that? All of the speculation, what good is that? So not just the 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 all of the amazing stories in Quran, but the the harvest, the most precious thing is that we we actually experience what's in Quran. So that's, to me, the, the key for myself, the thing that I cherish, that is every day. I am an old man who has done so many stupid things. I'm still a stupid old man. But when that light the, the light of Quran, the light of God comes into the heart, then um, I'm free from myself. I'm free because he is with me and I'm feeling that. So I'm the same stupid person <laughs> that I was before, but he frees me from that. He frees me from this. So to me, the Quran is about an actual harvest and, and, and integration. The words of Quran become integrated and we, we feel the expansion. We feel the expansion. It's very big. We're so small. This is very big, big beyond, beyond anything human being can, can comprehend. So to me, that is... The whole purpose, reading Quran, studying it, um, if giving talks, whatever. But it, it means nothing to me compared to what I think Quran is supposed to be giving to us, which is this uh, opening uh, of the heart, Sadr. So I talk a lot about Sadr because uh, I think it's very important for us as Muslims to see that it wasn't just a philosophy, it wasn't just even a religion in the ordinary sense. It was a path that opens us to the reality, the actuality, the experience. Uh, every day, every day, who can resist? I get up, I do my ablutions, it's long before the prayer time I start doing zikr. By the time it's fajr, I'm already in paradise. Then do, do the prayer, you see? So, so that's maybe a strange way of putting it, but that's how I understand it. 
Very interesting. So I've prepared questions, but I'll keep it aside now. So tell us more about your personality and أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ or أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ regarding the Prophet. So the, the idea of الصَدْر uh, وشرح الصَدْر and in your daily life, in your experience, in your journey. So how can a person live this spirituality and uh, feel it and feel the realities of the Quran and and uh, just like to live it uh, an ordinary person who would like to seek such uh, spiritual beauty or uh, reality or levels so what are the manifestations of that how can, can a person have a link and a connection to search to God or to the reality in his life and his experience and so tell us uh, uh, keep a mirror on your life and tell us some of the lessons for example well, the thing is, again, the I'm an ordinary person. I'm a carpenter, as I said. And also, when I was young, like many people, you have times that are dark. You have times that are difficult. And um, so the thing is that when I was young, I, was, I was, went through a, a, a difficult period of time, a very difficult period of time. And uh, and so I uh, I thought at the time this is terrible because maybe I will be um, I even have to say then if I truthfully that I even at some time was thinking suicide so like like many people this is the human condition the human condition especially the Western world but it's the human condition so it, it's important that we are weak, we recognize our weakness, we recognize our limitations. And actually, this is exactly, I think, what, what our Lord wants for us, that we see how imperfect we are, how weak we are. So we turn then to our Lord. So in a way, you could say that every human being, he, he didn't say, uh, that he only breathes into some people and not other people. His breath, his spirit is in all people. So even the worst person uh, is, is, can, can redeem themselves, you see? And that's honestly how I felt. Believe me, I felt completely lost as a young man, even though I was studying all of these things. In fact, you could say person who is lost, they study too much because they're looking for some way. And so I think all people, if they wanted to, they would then say, all right, what is the solution? Uh, he says, uh, God says in Quran, he says, come and ask me for forgiveness. Come and ask me for, your, for help. And, and that's when the key for any person, if they take that opportunity, and then they start to realize, now I have found at least some safe place for myself, of safety, because I found a way to turn to God. But even then, there's going to take years. This thing, I was not until 40 years old, maybe, I did, had, didn't, didn't have any profound spiritual experience in the, in the sense we're talking about Sadr. One has to obviously go through first the life and the stresses and the difficulties of life and that actually prepares us prepares us cooks us as the sufis say we get cooked and we have to be cooked some more until we are delicious you see so we have to and the best thing is that we turn to god in my zikr i am not just saying like la ilaha illallah or any of the others saying i am i am reciting uh, I'm I'm istighfar is a big part of my zikr. If I'm in zikr, I'm doing at least twenty minutes istighfar, because not not to gain gain something over some other philosophy or saying no, because it. I feel, um, I think what happens is that God wants us to talk to Him as a person personal God. He says, uh, I, I am here. Turn to me. Um, I love 
who, if, who, if whoever uh, turns away from the religion, I will bring another people that I love. I love those people and they love me. So that feels like God actually wants intimacy. Therefore, if he wants intimacy, we should speak directly to him. Like the man Moses encounters in Masnavi, who's saying, oh, come, I will, I will clean your clothes. I will pick the lice from your clothes. I will comb your hair. And Moses says, who are you talking to? And he says, I'm talking to God. He said, that is blasphemy. It's kufr, what you're saying. But God says, I did not send you to separate the people from me. I sent you to join the people to me. So he, so in this version, uh, God is uh, reprimanding Moses. And yes, the story is a little bit more complicated, but there's this time in our lives. I think most people, if they admit it, that life is difficult, very difficult. And if they handle it correctly, they will be transformed by their own suffering. They will be transformed because if they can learn to turn to a greater power, to God's power and presence. For Westerners, there's a lot of people, they don't believe in this at all, as you know. It's like in the in much of the European world, they are uh, either atheists or um, they're just, they just don't believe. Maybe they're not atheists, but they're agnostic, we say. And even an agnostic, one of the days, it's going to happen, they will realize they cannot do it on their own. They cannot. They will have to turn somewhere. And then they will, they will realize that there's that possibility. Not everyone, unfortunately, but inshallah, as many people as possible. Because to every one of them, God has put out his hand and said, come, is put out his word and say, I love you. Come put out his word and say, turn to me. And so anyone, anybody could, could do that. So in my mind, there's no limitation. Maybe someone who is like a very high position, maybe it's worse for them because they already feel they are in a high position, very well established, but maybe they are suffering inside. Maybe they actually are suffering even though they were raised and born in a high position. So, so I think every human being at any moment has an opportunity to find this in themselves. Very interesting. So you mentioned the ayah, فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ And also you mentioned the story of uh, Moses and uh, the shepherd in, in, uh, in Mathnawi and uh, a very great uh, insights. So you mentioned at the beginning uh, Al-Attar, that you were reading Attar in your early age and before knowing Islam and before going through this path. So after this journey, let us go back to Attar. Uh, or people like Attar, like Rumi and Hafez, and, uh, and this uh, the Persian literature which you uh, became uh, very interested in. So, so if I can ask you about some of the most important treasures that you found in this uh, heritage, what can you say? It's full of the treasures, I know, but what comes in your uh, mind first? Well, the thing about Attar that was so interesting to a Westerner was the, the analogy of these birds who all had different characteristics and then who had a guide, the Hudhud, and this guide takes them to, to meet uh, their king, uh, the Simurk. And so it's so exotic, it's so interesting um, but uh, Attar, I think he was trying also to um, teach Muslim. Now, these, whether it's Attar or Maulana, Rumi, as you know, they are theologians. They are not crazy people. They are not people, imposters. They are very good people. But they are using uh, analogy and metaphor. Now, for example, um, Attar... He is talking about Hudhud, and, and Hudhud is, of course, a bird. And this bird, uh, Solomon says, where is Hudhud? Um, if, if, if he doesn't show up here, I will punish him. Maybe I will kill him even. You see, this is in Quran. And, and, so, and then Hudhud arrives and says, well, 
uh, I'm here. I have gone to a place beyond where you can go. You see, he says this to, to Suleiman. And, uh, and, then, and so if we say, well, that's very interesting because he's the guide in the story about Simur. The next point is he talks about a woman who, a king, a, a, in a kingdom where there was a woman who was the ruler. And this, this queen, we know she is Bilkis. Okay? Now, uh, to give you an example of how my mind works, as I started to study that, those tales, I realize that if you look at the word Bilkis, and you do this sometimes, just look it for yourself, and read it backwards, Bilkis is equal to Simurk. You'll see. Now, is that a coincidence? I don't think so, because these people like the Sufis, they're using all kinds of interesting devices, Abjad, and they're using analogy, but this is a perfect example. He's creating a story, and he's choosing the Simurk is a well-known idea. It's this amazing bird that lives in Mount Kaf, is like almost impossible to arrive to. But if we pay more attention and we look at uh, uh, these words, you see, like let's say we take uh, Hudhud, for example. So if we have uh, uh, Hudhud, um, we will have the Abjad that will give us the will give us life. You see, the meaning of life, for example. If we do the abjad, you can see for yourself. But um, uh, so you have, you have these, these things that are in, these, in the Quran that the, these people, uh, like Atar, they believe that the Quran has an inherent abjad that is divine, and then they also believe that it's okay for human beings not to um, change anything in the Quran, but rather to use it as a way to draw people in. So the thing to understand is for me, when I started to realize this, because my mind had the way of thinking this way, and I had read, as I mentioned, people like Ali Shah and others, they had talked about Abjad. And so when I saw this, I thought, well, is it, uh, I wonder if I could try to understand this. Now, what I just told you about Bilqis, for example, is not in any of the things I read. It was by looking at Quran or looking and trying to understand the, what is the story like in Quran and what is the story like in terms of Mantikul Tair. And, and for me, Mantikul Tair was, was a great mystery. I spent years looking at it, thinking about it, thinking about, for example, the Asmal Husna and how we each of us have different characteristics. And so therefore, I was thinking all of these birds he's describing, they're like my friends. We all are different. We're all birds, but we are all different from each other. We are going on a journey, and, and that journey is going back to the one, going back to God. But, but there is a guide, and as I said, the Hudhud is the, in, the, in the Quran, the Hudhud has this really astonishing uh, position, you see? And um, so, uh, at any rate, so, so I remained very interested in that story over the years. And I read, and I started to learn Persian because I thought I have to start slowly but surely learning a little bit of Persian. And so I, uh, I actually contacted the United Nations office in San Francisco. I said, if you have any um, Iranian refugees I will, I will gladly be a volunteer and, and, and show them around. So this, this one uh, uh, young Iranian who was actually left uh, and went to India, and because he was actually, I guess you could say he was uh, an atheist, and, and he was uh, contrary to, to the, the regime there, so he went to India. And when he came to San Francisco, I was linked up to him by the UN office. And in my hand, I had a book that was uh, the, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, because that was very famous, as you know, in the Western world. We also were reading 
uh, this is before Rumi, because you asked me also about Rumi, but Rumi is more complicated in a way. So at, this, at this stage, the Omar the, Khayyam, the, everywhere, there were clubs everywhere in England, the United States, everybody was fascinated by Omar Khayyam. The only thing we were wondering is, why is there so much drinking? Like in the, but of course, it was not necessarily the, the actual drinking, it was a different drinking, you see? And so what happened is this, this uh, uh, Ali Zul Anwar was this Iranian young man, and uh, he later confided to me that he thought that the American um, uh, police uh, put a person for every Iranian coming in. He didn't realize I was just his, his, wanting to be his friend. So he looked at... Uh, the, the Omar Khayyam, and he was shocked. Like, why would I be interested in this? But nevertheless, he, he, he was the first person I'm learning Persian from, actually. And he spoke very little English, so I'm teaching him English. He's teaching me Persian. But we're, we're using Omar Khayyam as the medium. And as you know, Omar Khayyam is a, a pretty sophisticated quatrains, but it's full of wisdom. Some people say it's not Sufi. Um, my teacher disagreed with that. He says, no, Omar Khayyam has uh, Sufi, Sufi poems in it, you see? So, so then from there, you asked about uh, Rumi. Well, Rumi was also starting to become very well known. And I didn't, I didn't encounter him till after Attar. But as we know, Rumi is supposed to be a student. Like there's the idea that he met Attar and he takes the mantle of Attar. And, um, and so the, uh, uh, the, the, the thing there was the connection that I see there is in the Masnavi, you see the lineage, you see the lineage. Now, I'll give you just one, maybe one example where um, uh, you have um, Rumi is, is, is going to use uh, he's going to quote from Sanayi. Uh, so he says, Khushbayon kad on Hakimi Raznavi, Bahre Mahjuvon Misolim Annavi. Kizi Kor on Gad Nabinad Rairekol, in Ajab Nabuad, the Ashobi Zalol. Kaz shaoye of fetobe purzenur, raidegarmi, minayo bad cheshmekur. Very interesting poem, because he's saying, he's quoting from his, his ancestor, like even before Atta, the Sanai, and he's quoting from him, and he says, uh, the great teacher of Ghazna, who is Sanai, has, has given this, this uh, apt comparison, this, this, this apt comparison for those people who are veiled. I'm going to, excuse me, I'll say it in English, but you, you know perfectly well the line, but it's just for the case, because English is good for this, because then people can understand. So, is it for the people who are veiled? Um, uh, who, um, if they, if they uh, don't understand the inner meaning of the Quran, it's no big surprise they are the people who are lost. They're actually lost. Ashab is Zalod, they are, they are lost on the roadway. He says, but then the last line, very interesting, but from the shining rays of the sun, um, the, the blind person only experiences the heat so this is very interesting because he's not saying that nothing comes of it. It's, it's uh, the light, the sun. So there's obviously, as we know, we're out in the sun, we feel the heat. And if we have eyes that are working, we see the light. And he's saying, um, for those people who don't really understand Quran, they only receive the heat. Nothing wrong with the heat. It was cold. That's wonderful. But what about the seeing? How important that is. And so he's showing the difference, I think. Most of us think that he's showing that what happens if you, you take the Islam and the Quran 
And then you think, it'd be like a bottle of medicine and it's on your shelf and you just see it, yep, bottle of medicine, bottle of medicine, bottle of medicine, but now you open it and you drink the medicine. The difference is you, you are now, your eyes are healed and you are now seeing. So for me, Sadr is so much about seeing inside, seeing, um, feeling, seeing, seeing the actual light in during zikr and so forth. So, so I guess you could say the transition for me when I started thinking of Quran was Rumi is showing me that the Quran is not just an ordinary religious document and it's not just about the wars and this and that, but it has elements in it of all kinds of things for humanity. And like we said earlier in the divine names, it's necessary. The divine names are God's creation is full of all kinds of events. Uh, his own people, Quraysh, want to wipe them out. His, uh, uh, he, he, they are, they are, people say, oh, you know, the, 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 in Quran, they're only just attacking uh, the the Jewish people or the this people there's just no you look at Quraysh you say God is very furious with Quraysh and the and the things in the Quran are very harsh very harsh against Quraysh so you cannot say that that God is not um, reprimanding the the Muslims I would say there's much more if you read all of that you see clearly that it's a it's a fair game meaning if you're looking at at He's rep- God is reprimanding any way he's, he turns away. I see a God who is sad, who loves, who, who wants people to love him like he loves them. And he's like a sad lover. These people are, are not praying the way he wants. He wants them, not like robots. He wants them to love. To, when, they, when they, he says, some people come to see them and they, they, they hear the, the qira'at and they start crying. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, look, we were once, you see, so it's also possible to become inured, we say, to become uh, like you forget how magnificent, you see, how magnificent the Quran, the verses are. But if you have this seeing that Rumi's talking about, you are, you're too ecstatic. So if you see the verse, you, you, you cannot help it. You feel the power of the verse. So this is an interesting thing where I realized for the first time that the Sufis, like what Al-Ghazali said, there's a level where you can actually understand what's in Quran. And as you know, Al-Ghazali was, wrote so many books about uh, Islam and so forth. But he says um, so many interesting things. The most interesting is where Rumi, of course, is also getting his teaching is that you 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 have to take the, the Quran and you actually have to take it in. You cannot just look look at it. You have to take it inside. So so that's what really I I for me, it solved a lot of difficulties. I was not, um, I, 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 cannot, I cannot be a, a saint. I become angry. I become, I, I think I have full of faults. And now I'm reading the Quran and I'm saying, it's, it's accepting all the things, it's describing all of these things. I, am, I feel like I'm at home because it is not saying, Oh, I will become like Jesus. I cannot become like Jesus. You see, I am not pure like that. So when I'm reading Quran and I'm finally seeing, like finding a home for myself in terms of the religion, which religion, it feels, I feel at home. I feel at home because Rumi has helped me to, to understand what the purpose of it is, to understand the levels of it. And so that is really the, the way that this unfolds for me. And when after 9-11, uh, I was with my friends. They said, oh, we have a meeting. We have a meeting in Mill Valley where I live in that time. And, 
and uh, what are you going to say? I said, well, I've been in Afghanistan. I'm going to talk about that. And they said, well, you, you're not, are you going to say anything about Islam? I said, yes, I'm going to get up and I'm going to say I'm Muslim. And they said, but you never said to anybody that you were a Muslim. What? I said, why are you now? He says, now is the time. If you were going to get up and say you're Muslim, you better do it now because you're going to try to talk about, you have the, therefore you have the possibility of explaining to people that there are people who are not good people, who misuse Islam, and then there are, that doesn't mean that the, most of the Muslims are vets. So that's from, starting from that time, I did that. And I lost two-thirds of my friends because there's prejudice. I don't care. Fine. Uh, if that's what it takes, no problem. I'm still going to explain what I know about the beauty of Islam, about the the dangers in... Um, that's what I mean when Rumi says about Cheshmikur. See, it has its own problem. If the person is blind, why are they talking about to other people about the sunrise? The, the fanatics. If they are blind, why are they talking about the sunrise? It should be somebody who is seeing who should talk about the sunrise. I think you follow my my description. And so so I as I say, I found my home. I found my home. Very interesting. And and the name that you chose for yourself, Abdul Hai. Uh, there is much uh, to say about that also. It, uh, uh, it's, it's connected to your, to your experience and journey uh, too much. It's about the استجيبوا لله وللرسول إذا دعاكم لما يحييكم or what Quran says about الحياة um, الطيبة also. So, so interesting you chose uh, this name. And, and, and you, you were talking that when reading Attar and then when uh, يعني understanding Attar and the, the divine names that, the, that shapes the different uh, souls uh, of people also and um, here is a very interesting theme and all the people who are true spiritual seekers and especially people who study Persian um, uh, mystical literature, Attar, Rumi, Hafiz, Saadi, Sana'i, Shibistri, this is a main theme there and I guess you have something to say, the pluralist theme. Uh, so you mentioned that you, you are in a Christian society, your mother was a Christian and uh, and then you, you are a Muslim, and then you also you are, you are interested in Buddhism and Hinduism and the Taoism, and you're reading and these uh, stuff and such. So what does uh, those people have to say about uh, respecting uh, a human as a human, or respecting all different um, colors of people who are all, at the end of the day, are going back towards God, because inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Um, so which kind of deep, spiritual, pluralistic view you uh, understood or you were taught uh, from these great uh, Persian uh, poets? Well, the, the, um, the first point is that when I met Ustad Khalili, um, I was, you see, because uh, given my name, um, which is Dar, which is Robert Dar, uh, uh, you know, and I and and um, he and other people they were saying, well, you could be Haidar, you could be Sikandar, so I actually am Sikandar for a period of time, because locally, it it uh, uh, you have a local name, you see, so all of a sudden I have a local name as my name is Robert Dar, so I become Sikandar. Now, when I go up to the north of Afghanistan and I meet the Naqshbandiya who are at uh, Maimana, so there's the province of Maimana, there I meet a great uh, teacher. I meet the first uh, Sahib Jazba, that, that person who has tangible uh, uh, spirituality. The next thing that happens is that um, I do zikr there and um, and what happens is is interesting. I'm not Muslim yet, and I explain to them I am Christian. I am actually Unitarian, but I'm so I'm the only Christian. 
And there's a very, in Spy the Heart, there's a chapter where some Sufis come actually from another province. They say, we want to meet the Christian um, who is trying to, is helping us. But when I was doing uh, practices there, um, what happened is for the first time, I had uh, what we call like a spiritual opening there. And the manifestation was energy, light, um, was um, life, you could say. So that's how I got named Abul, Abdul Hai. Because we're traveling, there was an Abdul Hai traveling, but that's not, I didn't get his name. I got it from the Sheikh who said, you, your name should be Abdul Hai. Why? Because you are the servant of the living one. And that's when I started to say, okay, then what does that mean? means in the divine names, this is a very important name, Hai. And so I get the name that way because it's actually giving me the name based on the reaction I have in the zikr. So I become Abdul Hai. When I go back to the United States, I become Khilvati because my teacher there, he says to me, he doesn't take away Abdul Hai, he just says, you are, you are Abdul Hai Khilvati because I am, I am a person, I'm in the forest now. I showed you the forest. I live in the forest. I believe in, in the sacredness of the being alone, worship, especially if a person is older, they should spend time, uh, if possible, in my opinion, they should spend time for what time they have left. Whatever time they have left, they should spend that time. So, so, I, so I became several names, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is it introduced me to the idea of the divine names. And the more I studied that, the more I thought, this is even more interesting to me that actually the, the Quran has a psychological format as well as a spiritual format. So there's a psychology that I also learn about in the, in the East. Now, why is that? Because for one thing, I'm in northern Afghanistan, not in Pakistan. What's the difference? Abdurrahman Jami, for example, one of the last of the Naqshbandis, how does he feel about Ibn Sheikh Ibn Arabi? Very positive. How about the, the other, other <coughs> teachers there? They, he feels uh, especially positive about... Um, Sheikh Ibn Larabi, and by then Rumi has also become very, very accepted. At first, of course, Rumi was rejected. The, the, the Masnavi was so, they said, filthy, like you should pick it up with a tong because it's so filthy, you see. <laughs> because Rumi wanted to include, like the, the, the ocean has many fish, them some this fish, this fish, this. So he, he includes things that most people, they thought it was not... Uh, correct, you see. But in the north of Afghanistan, you have the, the Naqshbandi path, and they are, what do they, they accept the teaching of Sheikh al-Akbar, which if you went to Pakistan, there are a lot of people that were against that. So when you look at the Mujadidi line, they're wonderful people. I don't mean to, to in any way denigrate it, but if we were to say, why is is there what psychology is in northern Afghanistan? So, if you are looking uh, in the Fus al Hikam, then that was being read in the north of Afghanistan from whenever even it began. You see, it spread very rapidly. So, if you read Ismail, you have the, the idea of Rabbi Khas. So, you, if, so if you've read it, then you know there's this idea of the particular Lord. So if you have a particular Lord, it means that, like, for example, if I'm Abdul Hai, then my Lord, particular Lord, is Hai. You see? That's how they're thinking about it. And so you, you now are going to realize that. So you are not trying to become a different name. You are trying to become who you are. And you're trying to find your particular... Your real name or your real connection with God or... 
Yes, and this to me is a is an amazing idea. See, because I was also, as I told you, when I was young, I was in in trouble. I would go see psychologists and so forth, and so I knew a lot about psychology. Because most people who go and study psychology is because they have something <laughs> they want to fix for themselves. You see, so I knew a lot about psychology actually, and so now I'm finding what I would call a new psychology. Now, obviously, in the Quran, you have the 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 three nafs. So it's not like there's no psychology already in Quran, but this is more like a detailed, more detailed thing. So from that, I, I realize that um, I now need to study carefully this, this psychology that really goes back to, to Sheikh al-Akbar and as, as applied, being applied in, in, uh, so, so then if you have um, uh, hasiat, so if you have hasiat that is uh, uh, a particularity, and, you, and then now, just like a bird flying and you see the shadow on the ground, the negative part or the darker part of that bird is the shadow on the ground. And I am that person. I am not... You see? So there's an interesting psychology, the relationship between my faults, my difficulties, and my rabbi chas. So in other words, the cure is to understand that uh, I, can, I, I must follow a path. This is a huge thing in my mind, huge in, the, in Islam. Most people don't realize how, how significant of an advancement in psychology, we would say psychology. They didn't. They didn't say it that way. We would say it that way. Uh, but but it is psychology. It is about the nafs, basically. And if you're talking about the nafs, you're saying, well, who's the root of this nafs? What is the nature of that? And 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 how is it related to it? So to me, that was like a a very big opening, very big uh, opening. And it and so so because I because when I was young. I went to different kinds of psychology. My feeling about religion is the same. So to answer your question there, I thought I should know the other religion. There's a video you'll see of me because I posted it. I was in France because I raised in Tahiti, so I speak French. I was raised in French culture. And I'm walking in Le Marais. I don't know if you know that neighborhood, but it's a Jewish neighborhood. Now, if you go to that video, because it's in online there, you'll see that that suddenly, now I've been doing my zikr in the morning, so I was, I was pretty in a nice place. And I'm walking, and uh, there's some Orthodox Jews, which you can see in the video, and they are, they're trying to get recruits. So they stop me on the road. They say, uh, they, they sort of see my, my nose and my face. They say, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? <laughs> and I said, well, maybe my mother was Jewish, possibly, because she is Abreu. She's from the Abreu. Clan, meaning even though they're Catholic, a lot of those Catholics converted, uh, converted from Judaism to Catholicism because they they wanted to continue living in that part of the world. You see, so I said, and they said, well, in that case, you 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 are definitely Jewish because your mother. I said, no. I said she might be Jewish. They said, well, that's okay. And you'll see in the video, they 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 want then to bring me in, and they attach all of these Jewish things, and then. Then uh, we, they start dancing, and you'll see, if you look at it, you see, I'm totally in, in paradise. I'm dancing with them, and I'm, I'm laughing in my heart because I'm thinking, oh, Allah, how, how kind this is. You, you provide the people, they are, they are from another religion, they are from, this, from the same family of religion, and now uh, I was Christian, and I'm, I'm remaining Muslim, but I now also can feel what it's like for their joy uh, for that moment. You see? So, so, so in other words, yes, a lot of people object to that. They say, uh, uh, you, you should not uh, um, recognize that religion or you should not. And I, and I say, why not? They are all from God's religions at different times. Why would we? We don't. It's not going to harm. It, if it if it harms our Islam, then we have a problem there. But if it doesn't, if it enhances, makes our Islam more beautiful, more shining, then why not? Why not enjoy 
what God has made in other people. The only one, of course, I would not accept some devil worshiper or something like this, but you see, other than that, you say they are they are turning to God, as Ibn Arabi says. Now, isn't that what we learn from Ibn Arabi? That he says, everyone is on their path, and all of them are going in the same direction. He says, I believe in the religion of love and the caravans of love. You see, so Ibn Arabi, in other words, had a huge impact on all of us and Westerners, especially because it becomes philosophical. So they have more of a problem with Rumi. A lot of these people, the ones, the, the, especially professors and so forth. Mind you, I'm not against that. I'm just saying that's the truth. They want a fabulous philosophy, psychology, spirituality, all the most complicated and intricate and advanced, you see, we would say, compared to him being a kafir in, in other people's minds, you see. So, so the, the, it's, it's very interesting how the Western world has, has latched on to, yes, to Rumi, but very often the Rumi, as you know, is translated. It's a little bit too, I always say, they have sold the frosting on Rumi's cake. So you know how cake has frosting. And so a lot of the translation, they provide you with the frosting, but not the cake. So, so you are getting, it's too sweet. It's too, out of his they present him completely out, out of his context. Yes, yes, exactly. They've taken it very often out of his context. That's why those people like myself, we wish to translate it as, as close as we can, but still that it's nice to listen to. You see, but but not to, not to change the meaning, but to keep the meaning. Interesting. And, and yes. So you mentioned the uh, the religion of love, and here uh, I recall from one of your lectures where you were talking about the comparison between Sufism and Buddhism and Taoism. So you mentioned that all religions have one spirit, <clears throat> uh, and you quoted Farabi when he says that all religions have one source, but our imaginations about it differs. <clears throat> and then here, I'll, uh, so I'll ask you about love. And the centrality of love in the Persian literature and uh, and in spirituality in general. So uh, you say this uh, this verse from uh, Hafiz, I guess. Chist mi'raj falak in nisti ashikan ra madhab wadin nisti. So they're talking about the non-being and the mi'raj. Um, so yeah. if you uh, mention this verse again in Persian and then. Trans, um, explain it to us and also about the centrality uh, of love and the, the importance of that. <clears throat> yeah, so so this is Rumi in this case, so Chist Miraj Falak in Nisti. So we have the, the idea of the blessed Prophet, peace be upon him, and he has Miraj, as we know, is Muslim. The imagery is very beautiful, he's rising up into the different levels of heavens. And Rumi here is, is saying, what is that actually about? Meaning for, for not only for the Prophet Muhammad but, but for us, what does that mean for us? It means that, um, that there's Nisti, we would call it in English, the best way to call it, I think, would be the fertile void. We have an expression in English. It means that it is empty, but it is massively full. Uh, like like it is it is non-being, but it is massively full of of energy and potential, potential life and so forth. So so there where he says chist miraj falak in nisti ashikanra mazhabuddin nisti. So for the lovers, uh, the Ashokan Ramaz have is their it's their religion. It's their it's their sect and it's their religion, you see? So for the for the lovers, Ashokan and Ishq of course is used in the context of divine love. So if we give it another example, like what you're talking about, very famous, then we would uh, uh, say the he where he says um, he chikasro to nagardad ufano, nisro dar borgo he kibrio, chist miroje falak in, chist miroje falak in nisti, oshakonro mashabudin nisti. So it comes from that line. 
in, uh, in, in, in this very, very important uh, expression of Rumi's and throughout. So very important also, therefore, if I were to advise anyone to understand Rumi, he gives us a nardaban, he gives us a ladder, but he does it in reverse. So, uh, so he says, I chudo John Ro to Benmo on Makom, Kandaru, Beharf, Miruyad, Kalom, To Kesoza John Epoch, Asar Kadam, Sui Arsai Dur Pahnoi Adam, Arsai Bas Bogu Shod Bofazo, Vin Hayolo Hastio Badzu Navo. You see, so that's the, the part of the ladder from the top of this ladder. So this is a very important, this is his munajat. This is a munajat, but really a lot of munajat is not only about how someone feels, they're actually trying to teach you by saying that munajat, you see. So this lovely one, Oh, oh God, show the, the pious soul uh, that level. Kandaru beharf miru yad kalom where the words are sprouting up without letters, without visual letters. These are the divine names, you see. Um, and then so he goes on to there about... Uh, uh, so that the head can become like a foot racing through the vast expanses, the vast expanses of non-being. You see? So, so, so coming back to the idea of non-being, in my mind, it's extremely related to sadr. Because if you say, where could I verify what Rumi is saying? There's only one place you can verify it in your own experience of your own heart. He is not a fake. He is not a liar. He is not nobody. He is a theologian. He gives chutbas. He has he has a he has a, a, a strong pedigree. So why does he write such weird poetry, sometimes dirty jokes and everything? Because, like I said, he's trying to include every element of life. He's trying to be realistic. But the thing that's important to Rumi, from start to finish, it's going to be about Nisti or Adam. Uh, in the in the Persian, of course, it's going to be Nisti, and and the thing about. Nisti can mean two things also. It can mean that when I'm sitting in zikr, I am actually seeking to become nobut, to, to become, uh, uh, to, to lose myself. And the easiest way is I sit there, like I said to you earlier, and I keep doing the zikr until pretty soon he's, it's like walk, he's like erasing a blackboard. And at some point, this is the harder thing for people to understand, is fanon. Now, a lot of people say, well, um, they say, well, I, th- I had fanon because I did this uh, zikr, and then I was completely uh, uh, obliterated, and then I came back to myself, and, and I always say to them, well, that's kind of like what happens to me every night when I go to sleep, you see, I just lose consciousness, and then I wake up. I said, no, this is not the fanon that Rumi's talking about. The fano he's talking about is that I lose my sense of myself so completely that all that's left is my participation, my without self, but not Nomi. I, I remember what happened. I remember the vastness not only doing it, I remember the vastness coming out of it. So it's a very important distinction that we are intended at the deepest level to be that witness uh, of God's own presence. So, uh, as you know, in Quran, he says, so, shahid allahu innahu la ilaha illahu. Um, God is the witness. Shahid allahu. He is the only witness of there is no God but me. So that, that for Rumi is also the notion of Nista. You are not there. You are not doing the zikr. He is now doing the zikr. He was always doing the zikr. Um, you, were, you were not uh, look, needing a spirit. You already had spirit. You just needed the veil to pull away. 
you see? So, so Rumi's teaching is, is very helpful. It's a, he is dead, but his, his teaching is alive. His teaching is complicated. And, and, and in the West, it's been, as you say, what can you say? It's just sad, really. It's, um, it's not, it is, it's, it's food. It's the most delicious food. And, and all that's happened now is they're giving you the bag of the food is in, you see. So, so the, so Rumi, in my mind, is, is, is such a great teacher for us, and his credentials are impeccable. And yet many people, as you know, the conservative people, they, they, they don't, they reject it because they, they are having difficulty between, as usual, between Tanzi and Tashbi. They're so on the side of, of you know, Tanzi, they said they want no everything, nothing, you know, God is way beyond this. And the wonderful thing about Sheikh Al Akbar, he comes to correct this this misconception. And um, I'm a sailor, as I told you. So he talks about the two eyes. He talks about the eye of, of Tanzi and the eye of Tashbi. And he says very often people only have one eye, the mullahs. He says very often they only have the eye of Tanzi. And I said, well, that's like pirates when they were a patch on the other eye, you see. So, so, I, so the, the way, the, as they're growing up on sailing ships, where I think you know they wear patches on their eye because usually they've been in a fight or something like this. And, and so, but, for, but what Sheikh Akbar wants is that you understand both domains are important. And, uh, and, and Rumi, as you know, comes directly after Sheikh Ibn Arabi, does not, does not some people say they met, he met them, but I don't think so. The evidence is not good that, that, uh, that Rumi met uh, Ibn Arabi. However, they have a similar worldview put in different language. Rumi's putting it in a very visual language that if you speak Persian, or understand Persian, it it is so easy to absorb. Ibn Arabi is a great thinker, and his teachings are much harder to understand, and that's where the intellect has to be strong enough to understand what he's saying. With Rumi, the, the focus is on heart, but also on thinking thinking through. So Rumi is a, is a, they're both amazing teachers. We are very lucky to have them. And, um, and so that's how I, uh, when I bring teaching, like when we say these different other teachings, of course, when I teach about Buddhism and Sufism and all that, it's because I have learned from, in, in that case, especially from Sheikh Al-Akbar, the, the unity of the religions and and the purpose, and because I wish for peace. If you wish for peace, you you try to recognize other people's religions, and you try to to uh, show the the unity of spirituality, the unity of turning to what we would call God, and somebody else may say just the the furl void. The, the the they're not saying there's no. They, they, the word, they have trouble with one thing called the word God. They just have trouble with a word, you see? And we, we don't care. We are happy with that word. We are happy that he's either beyond, if he's Tanzi, then, then he, he, is, he is Allah. But if he's a Rab in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Quran, mostly we are being guided by our Lord is in, in Quran. And... Uh, and, and that's made very clear. So at the same time, you understand, yes, it's beyond everything, impossible for us to understand. And at the same time, he is with us wherever we are. He is always with us. And he allows us, he says, uh, because he says, my earth and my heaven do not, cannot contain me. But the sather and the heart of my servant, the faithful one, Yes, and so so this is this is a, a an experience. This is not an idea, not a philosophy. This is a reality, a reality. And, and if if God, now I realize the hadith may be open to criticism, but um, but the the fact is the people who experience that 
like Rumi, the, the poem earlier I mentioned about his Nardaban, his ladder, it's exactly about that. He's saying that there's a, there's, there's a, I won't go, it's a longer, it's, it's not, no point in going to all the way, but it, the, at the other end of the ladder, you're at the lower rung and you're trying to climb up this ladder. And, you're, and you have your nafsa amore, you have all kinds of things happening, and you're trying to get free from, from the, 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 those parts of the nafs that, that is, is really, um, I mean, I'm going to talk about myself. I think most of my life I have wasted in, in the nafs. Most of my life uh, I was a prisoner, and... So I'm not talking about other people necessarily. I'm talking about I know, and I, I said to, and I still cannot escape. When I when I get angry, I just say to God, "Oh, oh God, forgive me." And you are kahar, and I am the shadow of kahar. But I, I have no right. But you see what I mean. So even the fault in Islam, even when you have fault, you you're not ashamed because you realize it's part of the the asma al husna. And you realize that there's going to be Jalali and Jamali, and you're going to be reflecting these. So the but most of my life, honestly, I think I wasted most of my life on on pleasure, on on uh, um, satisfaction, on uh, you see what I mean. So 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 it's it's important to to recognize that. And, and in Islam, as I said to you earlier, for me, it's possible. It's, 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 it's not hard to admit these things because of the, the format and the presentation in Islam that, that is on the one hand seems simplistic and like flat world or whatever, and on the other hand is extremely advanced, extremely uh, complex. Very, very interesting insights. Um... Uh, brother or Mr. Uh, Abdul Hay, and uh, I don't like for this interview to, to finish, so I just finalize with uh, some of the insights. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So, you also mentioned two points here in relation to comparative religion studies or the, the openness towards other religions, where you say that um, in Persian poetry they use the word, uh, the, the word uh, uh, Bud for any beloved, and it's taken from Buddha. This is one point. Another point when, yeah. you said when the Prophet he destroyed the idols near the Kaaba, around the Kaaba, he left the image of Mary, Jesus, and Ibrahim also. So, if you'd comment on these two points and what the, do they mean? Yeah, so the interesting thing is when the, the Muslim armies um, coming to the first point you make, and they, 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 they're going towards, uh, they're spreading through the whole world. It's an astonishing thing. They go through Persia, they arrive at uh, uh, in in Sindh in India, and they are, um, uh, of course, uh, asking those people: Are you worship? These are idols you are worshiping, and in most cases, they're saying yes. These are idols, and so they destroy those idols. Now, when they get to to Afghanistan, they get to northern Afghanistan. They they come to the the Buddha statues. Now, fortunately for me, I was there before they were blown up. Some of those Buddhas, some of these big Buddhas in Afghanistan. Now, I'm a modern person, but you 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 look at them and now imagine when they were all in gold and everything. And so in in in, uh, in Bamiyan, but actually when they arrived, they were in the north of Afghanistan toward, towards Balkh in this area, and they see Maitreya. So they see the most astonishing. Uh, uh, Buddhas, and they they don't know they don't know the name of them, and they say they say you are worshiping this, and they and the people the, the Buddhists say, no no we would never worship that. This is a model. It's like a model for uh, how you sit, how you so so they had a different attitude towards them than say for some of the other religions, which the in the case of Iran, as you know, they had a dualistic religion. Which, which is not accepted in Islam. You can only be one, one God only. <laughs> so you cannot have, you know, uh, darkness and evil. And that's solved, the problem was solved in Islam with the uh, divine names and with God's own self-description. But coming back to Buddha, so they find out this is, this is Buddha, Buddha. So they bring back the word Buddha and the Buddha and the poetry um, 
is is uh, becomes a a major word because just like in idol, like in Arabic poetry, sometimes your mistress or your the one you love, they could suddenly use the word idol because it's true that you your attention is drawn to this person. Agreed. So so the so in the case of that's why um, uh, Shabistari, he says. Uh, Musulman gar bedonistike butchist, bedonistike din dar but parastist. So he says, if the Muslim knew, this is, you asked me, why did I go to Iran at that time? There was like a big, they, they, had, they suddenly said, we're going to, this book cannot be used. This, you see, they started censorship a lot. But, so, Musulman gar bedonistike butchist, if the Muslim knew what the idol really was, um, they would know that there's there can be worship um, uh, on the idol. You see, there's 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 religion in idol worship. Why? Because uh, uh, Shabbos study says uh, uh, he says consider the verse in men in lo yusabi ubihamdihi walakena lataf kahuna tasbihahu. He says uh, uh, God says God says there is not a thing. In the in the whole universe, in the whole world, in men say in Eloi Sabi will be behind, except that it is worshiping God. It is it is praising God. Yusabi will be hamdi. But you don't understand its praise, he says. Meaning the people don't understand the nature of that praise, which is true for most people. Because how 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 can we understand what a, a leaf is saying? How can we understand what a Buddhist statue is saying. So Shabbos started, he's trying to make a point to the fanatical um, religious people who, who cannot see this. And he says, basically, he says, in other words, if, if it's true that everything is praising God, then this Buddha statue must also be praising God because it says, God says every single thing must be praising. So if you cannot see so he says to those people, if you cannot see the, the, the spirit inside of this, it means that you do not understand in men say in Eloi Yusabi hu bihamdi. You don't understand because God says that. So if you don't accept that, then, then it's your problem actually. So, so it opens a, an amazing realm where we as Muslims, we, we, we actually are being asked and this is coming back to the ecumenical thing with other religions. We're being asked to see the the religion in 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 virtually a- anything, anything like that. And and then if the, if a person develops insight, then actually they will hear and they will see when they come out from the zikr. And if they have had uh, uh, fana, they will see the leaf is praising God. They will see that themselves. It's not like some just some random sentence in Quran. No, they will see that the they will see that their eyes they see the majesty in nature. When I am myself, I never see the majesty. I see a little bit. If I go and do zikr, I go out and God shows me the majesty. So this is how important Islam is and how important it is to understand Everything. But also, you mentioned the uh, doctor about uh, the the uh, when the prophet he destroyed the idols near the Kaaba. He didn't destroy. Yes, them. yes, yes, uh, that, yes. So, so, the, so the, yeah. Now, 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 this is as you know. This is uh, uh, we we are told this, and some people don't accept this. Some people do accept this. But the whole idea there is that. Again, you have the sort of the circle around Kaaba, the 360 degrees. Uh, you, you literally have, you know, every degree you turn, there's another idol. And so the idols, of course, uh, we, we, of course we understand why. Now, as you know, the whole problem starts up is why are there 360 idols? Because it's a big commercial venture. It is, it is like Costco plus, you know, I mean, you go from, people come from all over the place. There are all of these idols there. People are selling. It's the, it, Makkah is the place that's all happening. The Quraysh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ruining business. He's, he wants to ruin the business. <laughs> that's the problem for them. It's not, they, they, I think their biggest 
problem is they're worried about their status and they're worried about their business. Because when you look at why are they so upset? Who cares? Why should they care? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I'm revealed, this is I'm revealed. If they don't, they just leave it. But they had a lot to lose. That's the problem. They had a huge amount to lose. So after all the fighting and everything, and and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and the, the Muslim, they come in. Of course, they're going to take take out the idols because that was the whole point, the whole complaint. God says is is tawhid. This is the the, the, the reality is tawhid, and 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 it doesn't mean there's not room for like what Shabastari says or like what he also says in Quran that everything is worshiping God necessarily, meaning fundamentally, fundamentally. But at the same time, the idols they they make people attached to nafs. They fail then to feel the spirit of God. They may not then have a good future. So the whole idea of destroying the idols is to try to give Pearson people a chance to have a better eternal future, a better uh, uh, correct relationship. And so so do I, do I, I, I just, I, there I'm just explaining what I have read. Some people don't accept that. Some people do accept that. You know, the whole idea that inside, that, that the whole thing is so sacred that you have this image of Mary. And some people say, well, there's other image, there were other images. That I don't know. But I was using that as an example when I bring that up because the, the to me, that's the fundamental thing. Makkah was... It should have been the shrine and place of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and it turned into a market, turned into, it's just like the Western world today with so many, like all of us, you know, we have to look and say, say what, even now, even you go to Makkah now, if you go there, it could be, it could be, you could, you could argue that, hey, you know what, this is getting, it's losing the jazba, it's losing, it's being, it's being drained by the people there, and and it becomes commercial. You become commercial. It's very sad, and um, but uh, so so yeah. So that's how I think about it. Just before we finalize, um, uh, Mr. Abdul Hay. So just I want to ask about the special days that you had in life. So so the day that you chose finally that today I'm uh, transforming to Islam. Did you recall it? Uh, was what was so special about that day, and why you? Uh, uh, waited until you became 40 or 43. You mentioned 91. So 91, I guess you was there in the, in the beginning of the 40s. So it's a, it was a journey uh, until you reached to a peak point that you took this uh, decision or it came when it came or, or, or how it is. And that day specifically, you had spe- a special feeling or um, experience about it? Because I, okay, so in 1991, I was at Rumi's tomb. Now, prior to that time, for years, uh, because I was also a student of Humayun Etimadi, the great painter and the, the, the king's cousin. And so I said to Humayun Etimadi, I said, uh, he said, I'm going to be fasting. And I said, can I fast with you? And he said, oh, you, you want to fast? Uh, you are becoming Muslim? I said, no, I don't know. I just want to know, is it possible for me to succeed? Because how can I fast? For 30 days, this is very difficult. So I did that for three years with him. And, and I did all the fast, everything. He and I were together in, in, uh, in Islamabad, in Peshawar. We were in Peshawar and, and he was with me because he was teaching some of his students there. So I was clo- very close to, to him. Ustal Khalili had died, but Humayn Etimadi was his friend, and Humayn Etimadi was the great painter, and he taught me miniature painting. So I was very close to him. And, when, and I remember I was with him in the third year when I was fasting, and at the end of the fast, we were in Peshawar, and everybody, there was like dozens of people because I was running the organization, they said, we know, we, we know he's going to come into Islam. We know he's going to come into Islam. And, and it didn't happen. And they were so disappointed. I felt so badly because they, they thought, for sure, I've done the fast. And it was hot. It was hot in, in Peshawar. And even with all of that, it, you know, I stuck with it and, 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 and experienced it. And then, 
and then and so they thought for sure he's he's now going to we're just waiting. In fact, there was a feast, and everybody was anticipating. Maybe there was a rumor. Maybe there was a rumor, and I and I said, uh, no, I I I'm just very happy to be with you, Muslim. I'm very happy to do the fast, and I could tell they were they were disappointed. So about a year or two later, I'm in Konya. I'm sitting in a hotel. I'm doing zikr, and I have the nur, the, the massive uh, uh, light. And, and my eyes are closed, and I, I feel also a great presence. And, I, and, the, and then when I come out of that, I'm thinking, it's time. I, I'm going to come into Islam. So I go, and I see friends there. We go to the mosque, the beautiful the qira'at, the, the, the beautiful place, beautiful place to come into Islam. It's not busy. In those days, pff, believe me, a third full, the, the mosque, you know, or less. That's when I come into Islam because the game is over. I realize I don't need to keep testing myself. Will I succeed? Will I not succeed? If I don't succeed, I would just turn to Allah and ask forgiveness. If I succeed, then you see what I mean. I, I got rid of all of the reasons, so that's that's how that happened. But it was not until 1991, and right after that, when I came to the United States, and I had lost the the Saibid Jazba I knew in Afghanistan. He was gone. I could never find him again. That's when I met Ras Muhammad Zare, the great Saibid Jazba, who who was living all the time. He was living near me in California. And I didn't know that. And so then I met him, and then I became his student for a long time, you know, 20 years or so, yeah. Very interesting. So, uh, um, yeah. so uh, Mr. Abdul Hay, uh, the last question is Farsi. As you ask me, what is the Zaban of Farsi for you? Why is this so beautiful and زبان فارسی برای شما چرا اینقدر مهمه و جذابه اگر به زبان فارسی هم جواب بدید که شما چقدر زبان فارسی رو دوست دارید و چقدر زندگی کردید با زبان فارسی و چقدر بهرمند شدید از همین میراث دیگه عرفانی فارسی و مولهنه و سعدی و سنائی و اضافه کنید که قبلا نگفتید که ما هم استفاده کنیم با همین زبان زیبای فارسی شما من که در, در پشاور بودم اونجا که دفترم اونجا بود و که چیزی اول ما گفتم که جای ما یعنی از خانه که کرا گرفتیم که در پشاور بود گفتم من هیچ آمریکایی قبول نمی کنم یا اروپایی قبول نمی کنم تنها فقط افغان ها فارسی زبان ها که بعد به این خانه قبول می کنم روز شب تنها فقط در فارسی می خواهم صحبت کنم با من انشالله که آهستا آهستا که کمک کنید شما که میخواید که یاد انگلیسی میخواید یاد بگیرید با من ما پرس که من خودم لازم است که فارسی فارسی را باید یاد کنم چرا که کار ما بود که من میخواستم که کمک مردم افغانستان بکنم و دیگر که این تر شیرین است شیرین است دیگر که بسیار منظم نسبت نسبت به با انگلیسی انگلیسی بسیار عجیب و غریب است بسیار بسا مشکل است برای مردم مردم از خارج که میان که انگلیسی بسیار مشکل است با نظرم فارسی ای من میگفتم با رفیق ها و دوست ها گفتم که فارسی لسان ملل متحد باید باشد از اینکه ایتور ایتور مقبول است منظم است و بهترین بهترین لسان است و دیگر چیزی که ما میگیم ایندو یورپین لنگویج یعنی عربی مشکل است از اینکه در اما که سانسکریت فارسی تا لسان های اروپایی تمامش از, از یک ریشه آمدند و از آن خاطر برای من آسان بود و من نمیفهم چرا 
زود یاد گرفتم دیگران گفتم که خب چطور شما یک ماه پیش شما بسیار کم صحبت کردید گوان بسیار خوب بسیار بسیار آسان بود برای من فضل خدا و از خاطر که بسیار شیرین هم است و من میخوام که مولانا میخوام بخونم شبستری دیگرها میخواستم یعنی که توش نبودم بیشت. و فارسی هم بسیار بسیار دوست دارم دری مخصوصا دری یعنی دری فارسی یک چیز است ولیکن دری یک چیز دیگر است که و من که دری یاد گرفتم so that's what happened you see و درسته که زبان فارسی زبان عشقه همون دیگه عشق خیلی استفاده میشه تو ادبیات فارسی چه مولانا چه حافظ چه سعدی چه سنایی و عطار و اینا چطور اینا نیستن دیگه درباره عشق صحبت کنه اصلا بعضیشون میگن اصلا دیگه زبان عشق همین فارسی حتی عربی و انگلیسی نمیتونن همون دیگه عمق این مطلب و محوریت این دیگه دوستی و عشق دیگه بیان کنن مگر فارسی درسته واقعا که فارسی لسان عشق است و از, از اگر در انگلیسی مثلا یک وقت بود تقریبا دو ست سال پیش نزدیکتر مثلا به امی کلتور از ادبیات فارسی در ما که شاعر از آن زمان بسیار شیرین بود انگلیسیشان و فارسی تا امروز فکرتان باشد که در 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 700 سال یا 500 سال هیچ تغییر نکرد در در در, در شمال افغانستان در دره های مردم اون جای که بسیار ساده هستن اونجا هستن که چند صد سال اونجا یک لسان دری که یاد دارن که صحبت میکنن و هیچ تغییر نکنن بسیار بسیار دلچسب است عجیب و غریب است انگلیسی هر سال هر دو سالی که تغییر میکنند و انگلیسی بسیار تکنیکی شد و بسیار گتوت شد و, و از آن خاطر که, که امی, امی کلتور عشق یعنی که میتونیم بگویم که, که فارسی بسیار لسان عشق لسان شعر لسان ادبیات بسیار بسیار قوی است نسبتا انگلیسی از عربی نمیتونم بگویم فقط از که من عربی در قرآن یاد میگیرم و این دیگر چیز است یا بسیار کلان است بسیار بسیار کلان است ولیکن و اونجا هم در سوره یوسف هم جایی هایی که دیده میشه یعنی که عشق بسیار قوی میشه لیکن من افسوسی که نتانستم تا حالا که مثلا در صحبت که عربی استفاده میکنم لیکن فارسی یه مثل که مثل که لسان خودم در تفلی بود که من که چند ماه یک سال نمیرم اونجا فراموش نمیکنم هنوز هنوز دارم نسبتا مثلا اسپانوی زیاد زیاد رفتم اسپانی رو دیگه نمیفهمم که که یاد میگیرم پس فراموش میکنم این <تصفيق> اما فارسی هیچ وقت فراموش نمیکنم از لسان لسان قلب لسان ادبیات است بسیار مقبول لسان بسیار مقبول است that annoys you that you feel it's the, the, the most negative point in the era that we're living I think when we see all of the um, difficulties in terms of politics, in terms of religion, um, we see a, a tremendous danger, but even more dangerous, as we know, all of us who are watching carefully, uh, it is like some fish chasing some other fish, and then a, a shark comes behind and grabs them together, is a global climate change. The change, I think, is going to be so immense in the next 50 years. It's already, we look around us, we see the impact. That, then there's population has caused need. So people living in, in uh, different countries, look at how much immigration, uh, illegal immigration, for people who just looking for a life, how many of them are rejected, their boats sinking, 
they're, they're, they're kidnapped for ransom. Think of all of the sadness. It is really uh, distressing to look at the human condition and look at the, the unwillingness of most people to help each other, to accept each other. So this is very sad. Um, and it's sad if you have children and grandchildren. So you're thinking, what's going to happen for my own children and grandchildren? What about all the other children? What about the wars? Look at all of the wars and all of the... Uh, we, we just see it. And this is, of course, dunya. This is, we, we, we have to say, this is the important thing. We say, I believe that this is what God has decided. I believe that um, I must accept that because um, if I turn, if people turn to his spirit, they will accept, they will say, there's nothing we can do. It's all in his hands. But what he wants us to do is to try to be nice to each other, try to help each other. But when you look at the one, see the thing about Islam that was very important to me is it doesn't offer a strange God that is always doing only good things. You see, like, like a strange idea. It's, it's much more complicated than that. It's an explosion of things coming into being as you know, and, and, and within God's knowledge are all of the things that are uh, either on the side of the mercy or on the side of the wrath. And he possesses those qualities that he says. So when I see these things, I still do not despair because I'm thinking this was all intended to be this way. Yes, we are the puppets. We are the actors of this. But he is the one who says in the Quran, he says, no, no one can do anything good or bad without my uh, influence and my permission. So I, from that point of view, Islam is comforting. So I'm not as annoyed as most people. When people say, well, the, the earth is going to, to be devastated because of global change, I say the earth is in the domain of, of spirit and and you can never, you can never destroy the spirit of nature, which belongs to the divine. So, so I'm actually not pessimistic in the way most people are. I simply do what I can. I see the, the I feel sad, but I don't despair. I think this is, uh, this is what Allah Ta'ala has decided. And so I accept that. Robert, Daryl, thank you very much for all the, these beautiful insights that you shared with us today in these two hours. Uh, thank you very much. And hopefully we can meet again through in the net or there in, in the California. One day, inshallah, one day, inshallah, I will be in your, in those t realms where you are living and your friends and so forth. I, uh, there's so much in life. I'm, I'm older, but I still have the thirst for seeing more of the world and inshallah one day we will encounter each other in person thank you so much for inviting me i really appreciate that